good evening, everyone. I had a conversation with someone this week, and it spurred this idea to do a uh, do a message on the subject that I'm going to bring you tonight. We'll talk, maybe talk about that in a little bit. But in 1972, when we were in Ambassador College, we had field trips. We'd go out every once in a while, and we'd take a sack lunch with us, so we'd go somewhere. This time, we went to the Cotton Bowl, and uh, I had a date, uh, Jan Peterson. <clears throat> And we got off the, she's a very sweet woman, a real talker, very personable, very outgoing. And uh, we got off the bus and everyone shot off to the Cotton Bowl and there was a wax museum, well, big park right there. And there was an elderly man, white hair, elderly man sitting on the, um, on the park bench. So it's time to eat lunch, of course. And so we took our sack lunches, came over, introduced ourselves and asked him if we could sit down and. He graciously said yes, scooted over. We sat down and we began talking to him. And it was amazing what all was inside that man, what all the experiences that he had done and what we learned. And we sat in that on that bench for two hours talking to him while everybody else was out in the in the cotton bowl doing different things. But it was very encouraging to hear his experiences and the things he had done in his life. Uh, it was very inspiring. We really were awed by the here was this individual sitting there and, and was just full of, of character and full of uh, moral fiber and some of the answers that he said, things he had done in his life and his outlook on life. It was really exciting. Uh, he just emoted this moral character. And here he, here he is when we got on the bus and we looked back and there's this, he's still sitting there on the bench, this white haired elder, elderly man. We really got to know him well. But it reminds me, if you'll turn to Proverbs 29, or 20, Proverbs 20, Proverbs 20, verse uh, 29, it tells us something that is, again, it's very interesting as well, how God has put these things together. You know, it talks about the evidence of things not seen. Everything he does in, in creation points to him, points to his plan, points to God, points to the, the plan for mankind that God has for all of us. And here, this is no different. Proverbs 20, Proverbs 20, 29, it says, the glory of young men is their strength. Now, I was 20 something and I was, you know, I felt like I was pretty strong, you know, and so I, here it says, the glory of young men is their strength and the beauty. It's interesting that it says beauty of old men is their gray hair, their white hair, their gray hair. That's their glory. It's not the strength. It's the white hair. Why did God do that? Why, you know, he could have made us born or created at age 25 and we never aged and we stayed the same and we lived 70 years or are better. And, we died, never changing, just like we were made. But God had a plan, had a purpose for the seasons, for growing us through these seasons. And also our bodies changing. You know, things don't quite work the same and things sag in other places where they should, you know, where they didn't when they were 25. And, and we're, we're, you know, our hair changes. It turns to white, it turns from gray to white, from black or brown or red or whatever to eventually white. So we could have spent the whole afternoon there with very profitable and up uplifting, listening to these experiences. Very positive, his very positive outlook that he had. You know, there have been others, too, and I'm going to try to do something here. There have been others, too. Um, I think of I'm going to share the screen with you guys. Hopefully you can see what what I'm going to put up here. Maybe uh, John, John and Heidi, John, if you'll unmute your microphone and tell me if you can see the screen, I would appreciate that. And there have been other guys. You don't know their names. Can you yes, see my? Yes, I can see it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. So there have been other people that you wouldn't know, but here in the Indianapolis area through the years, Cecil Mann, Clee Sprague, Bob Louder. Gordon Burns, all of them are men of honor and, 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 and just sort of commanded respect and honor by not 
not anything that the world would see, but by their character, by the way they held themselves and the way they did things. And just just give you an idea here. These these all all these people here have something in common. And I think you'll probably see it right off the bat. Now, this these could be us. I didn't have time to go around and take pictures. I wish I could have. But all of them have. Oh, there, there I am. That's me. <laughs> all of them have something in common, don't they? So I'll take the screen off. But they all have something in common. And, and what they have in common is the fact that they have white hair or gray hair and they've aged. Of course, the definition of elderly, can, it changes. And the U.S. Census Bureau says it's 65. And I take exception to that. But uh, you may, too, as well. It's I think it's a state of mind. It's what, what you feel, how you feel. It's your positive outlook. It's where you are, what you're able to, to do and the way you think. All has to do with, quote unquote, elderly. The Bible talks about old age or great age. It also talks about elders and elderly. But all of them had something in, in common that was their white hair. And what the way they carried themselves and the respect and the honor that we gave them was due to the way they lived their life, the things they thought, the way they dealt with other people. It was that godly presence. That's the way God has developed us, fashioned us, created us, and he has a purpose for it. It points us to something. Physically, it points us to old age. Spiritually, it points us to something else. So in 1982, I was married. Terry and I, no longer in college, went to England for the feast in 1982. And we toured England for two weeks. And then took a week to, to go to Torquay, which was uh, on the southern part of England and a very, very beautiful area, seaside village. But while we were there, we those two weeks, we toured quite a bit, actually the London area, most of it, Westminster Abbey, Windsor Castle. We saw a marching band. These are the things I remember. Marching band, the Scottish Highlanders. It was really, really amazing. We went to Harrods and saw the marketplace where they bring on all the, the food and the live, you know, rabbits and pheasant and all. Big Ben and then the London Bridge. But, of course, we went to the Tower of London. And that's what I want to tell you about. Down in the basement of the Tower in L London is the Crown Jewels. The Crown Jewels. And I should get a show of hands to see how many people have seen them. But they're, they're quite amazing. Again, I'm going to share the, the screen. Hopefully it, it comes up here. <clears throat> As I looked up the crown jewels definition, I was going to see if I could find out what the jewels were and when you know, they could itemize them. I didn't find that. But one thing I did did catch my my eye was the comment that the crown jewels are a reminder of the consistency of the monarchy. The consistency of the monarchy. Now, I thought that was really interesting that they would say that. Uh, and I'll tell you here in a minute why. Here, here are some pictures of, uh, and I'm not sure which, there are several crowns in the Tower of London. I know the one, that, I think this is the one they use for the ceremony. But look, is, see, see the thing in common? She has a crown on, and she also has white hair. There's a very good picture of the physical and the spiritual symbolism that God wants us to see as we age, as we wear that crown of that white white hair and there's another picture of the crown now this this one's a little different and that one's different as well so but they all are crowns just a side light i just want to throw this out here the symbols of continuity of the monarchy the crown jewels god promised and if first kings you can write these down we'll look them up later maybe First Kings 8, 25, God promised that there would always be someone to sit on the throne of David. Now, that's interesting. One of the things we saw when we were in England was the throne with the stone under it. Acts 2, 30, we see that Christ will ultimately be raised up to sit on his throne, which will be David's throne, the throne of David which supposedly is in England. And Luke 9, 1, he, he gave them power and authority as he sent out the apostles. 
He gives us power and authority, doesn't he? Where does that authority come from? It comes from God. It comes from Christ. It's not ours. We can do nothing of ourselves. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And he sent the apostles out, the 12 out, with power and authority, the Holy Spirit with them, and the authority to go do these things, heal the sick, cast out demons, preach the gospel. And then in, in Revelation 26, he says the priest of God will reign with him for a thousand years. So that authority that's given to a monarch, that's given to priests, princes, and kings, and sovereigns, comes from God. But we'll be ruling with him. Those priests of God will be ruling with him. Revelation 5.10 will be kings and priests. Luke 19.17, Christ talks about the parable of the talents. He gives the, the authority over 10 cities to the one who did the most. Authority and power over 10 cities. Those are things God wants us to focus on as times around us get tough. He wants us to remember, look down the road. Now, you know, and I, I mentioned this before, but in Romans 4, 17, it talks about he calls the things that aren't as if they are. He says, you're going to be a king. You're going to be a priest. Well, you're not now. We're not now. I'm not now. But if I have and my hair is getting grayer, I'm only halfway there. <laughs> that is a reminder to me of the, the goal that God wants us to keep our focus on and to endure to the end, to stay on that. We're going to be in Galatians 4, 7. It talks about us being heirs of all things. The Christ is heirs of all things. We'll be co-heirs with him, won't we? And Hebrews 1, 2. I know I'm going through these fast. Christ is heir of all things. And again, we, we will be with him heirs of that as well. Of all things. So that, there are many crowns. The Bible talks about many crowns. In, the, in Revelation, there's five or, or maybe more, but I know of five. I think there were like five or six, and it's kind of, it's kind of interesting, in the Tower of London. They had different uh, purposes. And God's word speaks of many crowns. And I, you know, I mentioned that in the, uh, in the invitation to, to, to look them up. Maybe I don't want to go too far with all of these. We, I put scriptures beside them. Maybe we can talk about that in the, uh, in the discussion time but there's a crown of old men and women and that crown is their children president bush the older president bush said the way he gauged success in his life was if his children came back and visited him now i thought that was really interesting that he would see that as honor and treasure and something that he would see as success that his children would come. And the Bible talks about the crown of old men in Proverbs 17, 6. The crown of the wise. There's a crown of, the, of anointing. There's a crown of gold. There's a crown of rejoicing. It talks about in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. And all of these can be sermons. We could go through each, each and every one of these. And then the crown of life, James talks about in 1, 12. After being tempted and overcoming, there is a crown of life for us. So those are crowns that the Bible talks about. It represents, a crown represents, it's symbolic of many things, but position, purpose, honor, virtue, character, authority, and power. If you turn to Ecclesiastes, there's the other side of the coin. The Bible talks about all of this as well. But he warns us, you know, in Ecclesiastes 10, how many times have you seen someone that should know better, somebody that's a politician or a, a leader in ind industry or a leader in the neighborhood or a leader in the community or someone you can look to and follow their example? Doesn't seem to be that many of them today. In Ecclesiastes 10, verse 1, it warns us about that. It says, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So does a little folly. That is in someone that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So if someone in that position gets in trouble or does something that's untowards or not uh, the way they should be doing, uh, it stinks. That's not my words. <laughs> that's what the Bible says. So crowns are worn by kings and they're to be above, you know, the fray. They're supposed to be moral, virtuous, righteous. 
And uh, if you see that, then it commands honor. It commands your respect. You want to emulate that. So they represent honor and virtue. Uh, the old man that I saw on the bench, he didn't have to say, he didn't have to demand it. He didn't have to say anything. All he had to do is talk, give, give his experiences, his take, his opinions, and, and all of those just rang clear that this man had character. He lived his life. If you look in Leviticus, Leviticus. Now, this is what I wanted to do with this man. And by the way, I have uh, I told my children, my two girls, that uh, I taught them early to always stand up when an, an elderly person walked in the room. Actually, anyone that was older within reason. And today they still do that. They will still get up and give their chair away. Uh, that does several things. If we did that more in society today, we would have I don't think we'd have the disrespect for, for the police force and, and those in authority uh, as much as we do. But it's not taught. It's not taught. It trickles down into even more. It, it's the way we look at laws and structure, the folkways and the mores of society. It's the way we look at those. We look at them. Uh, they're wrong. They're off kilter. So Leviticus 19, verse 32 says that you shall rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear your God. I am the Lord. Now, that says a lot there. It says, rise up, stand up, not in defiance or anything, but get up and give them your chair. Get up and acknowledge the fact that this person wears the age and the life of experiences and, and things that have gone for forward or gone by physically if they're in God's church and have God's Holy Spirit spiritually and you see where they're going and who they are and what the potential is and that God sees them and God you know loves that person and, and has that they're a special calling that that person has so that's just an indication that that's at who that person is so you rise up before the hoary head honor the face of the old man and by doing that then you're fearing God in uh, Proverbs. Now, something interesting. In 1972, <laughs> I happen to know this, that the ratio of the youth and the elderly, quote unquote, that we would call el elderly was one, one in eight. Okay. Today, that dynamic has changed almost flip flop, I would say. I mean, it's probably not quite that dram dramatic, but the, it's not one in eight. Uh, I think we can all uh, contest to the fact that it's probably more like maybe five and eight <clears throat> or six and eight. We are an older church. We're getting older. And uh, if you look at, if we had a big feast site, we had a thousand people and you look out there and it'd be a sea of white. Uh, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Uh, God's in Christ is in charge of his church. If he uh, wants to change that back to one and eight, then that's that that'll happen. So in Proverbs 16, verse 31. It tells us something here. All those people you saw and you saw the queen with the crown. It says the hoary head is a crown of glory. It's a crown of glory. Now, it's not necessarily a crown of glory. There's a there's a <laughs> there's an if in here. It says if it be found in the way of righteousness. So you see someone who's doing what they should be doing, and God has called them, and He's given them His Holy Spirit, and they're following His rules. Uh, the definition of righteousness, so, you know, it's uh, Psalm one nineteen one seventy two. All your commandments. And then earlier it says all your testimonies, all your precepts are righteousness. Those are written and given in love, loving God and loving your neighbor. And when you do that, that filters all the way down into all the commandments and everything and all everything that you know, God says for us to do. If it's found in the way, that way of righteousness, then it is a glory. And it's a crown of glory. 
so it, there is a there is a, um, a caveat there. All all of the physical pictures that you saw of those physical individuals had white hair. The Bible tells us the crown of glory comes with those who have God's Holy Spirit and are living that way of life, and it's promised. It also says that it's promised life, that we are promised spiritual life. So it reminds us of God's plan, God's calling, God's promise. It also reminds us of something that's very great and very valuable and very lasting, eternal life. And that's a promise. And we'll see that in a little bit. It represents, again, it represents something awesome, very awesome. A crown that we're going to carry, we carry now physically. If we're in the church, we have God's Holy Spirit and we're trying to do what God gives us to do. You know, not all all of us well wear it well, but we all wear it. And uh, I want to tell you about a story about an individual at the feast years ago. Uh, We'd gotten out of services and we went to a convenience store. We're in the parking lot and getting ready to go into the store. And we saw an elderly man uh, with his wife who had a a, a walker and he was pushing her. Now, and, and she was almost falling down and he would push her again. He'd push her again. And the girls (laughs) <laughs> well, they weren't going to take that. They went up and they really gave him, you know, told him what, you know, in a nice way, but in a firm way, you don't do that. Don't push your wife. And, you know, today you probably get, you get in a lot of trouble, but I, I think they'd still do that. So it was the opposite. It was showing the opposite of how you would respect and honor, uh, show honor and, and, and uh, to that individual. A crown of glory. Even you know in the church, but in the world as well, is a stabilizing presence. We're called salt. We're to be a light. We're to be like Christ, and 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 be that flavor and that savor in the world. He wants us to be in the world, and there's a purpose for that. It's a stabilizing factor. You know, if it wasn't for the elect's sake, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be a, a plan of God, of course. It points out someone we can look to and honor, go to for advice. All of you would go to for advice. Gives us an example to follow, someone to emulate. Some We see Christ in that person. We can emulate that. It, it gives us encouragement. Uh, it bears our burdens, and we bear theirs. If they lead the way, the, glo- the, the crown of glory, that white hair leads the way. And it's a support. And it's wisdom. Wisdom. You have knowledge. You have understanding. And then God grants wisdom. And if you don't have wisdom, ask for it. He says, if you lack wisdom, ask God for it. And he's going to give it to you. He'll help you with that. You know, sadly, again, like I said earlier, sadly, the world sometimes and sometimes in the church, the crown of glory is overlooked. It's not respected it's disrespected not necessarily openly but just by the fact that it's you know i've seen it before and i and i won't go into detail but and and it's very sad if you turn to dan daniel you know the world disrespects authority disrespects basically they do their own thing they want to do their own thing and to, no matter what, I see it out on the road all the time, people cutting people off and the way they think and the way they, their attitudes are. And it's, it's a shame because it's overlooked. But God, what they're doing in Daniel, it talks about God the Father being the ancient of days. Now, God is not uh, bashful about the fact that he's the ancient of days, uh, that he's been around forever. You know, sometimes people say, hey, you know, that guy, he's been around forever. Well, we and the and the society puts them down, puts the world, puts the elderly down, puts the aged down, and it's a, it's a, you look at the advertisements. It's the youth. Everything's about youth. It's the pride of life, and it puts down anything that has any stability or moral value to it. The elderly, the white hair, and so they're putting God down. That's what they're doing. He is the ancient of days and rever. You know, it tells in Revelation 1.14, it gives a description of him having white hair. Hair as white as wool. 
So God doesn't overlook the elderly, or the white haired or the crown of glory. It's very important to him. It's something that is part of his plan. It's part of his uh, information for us. It's part of the mystery that we understand. And, uh, you know, with the difficulties that happen to us on a regular basis, it's it very important to have a session like this or a, a venue where we can come together and we get to know one another. We can bear one another's burdens. We get to find out what this person's about and some of the experiences like the, the old man on the uh, on the bench, the elderly man on the bench. Uh, and boy, I tell you what happens is that it just opens up a vista of um, every little tidbit you un- you find out. A very experience that they, this individual has done just just totally what opens your understanding and draws you closer and makes you even closer to this person want, wanting to uh, you know know your family love your family be part of that family so that's what this does and God has had you know like I, I, I mentioned that last time in Malachi in Malachi it talks about he lives he, he, he's well, let's just turn it real quick Malachi Again, it's it's a favorite scripture, three. I think it's sixteen. I know where it is in the page. <laughs> he says then, yes, it is sixteen. Malachi three sixteen. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another. That's what we do. That's what we're doing here. And the Lord hearkened. The Lord heard it. It got his attention. He heard it. And he heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, says the Lord. In that day when I make up my jewels, you saw the crown? Now, it's, it's no uh, coincidence that there are jewels on that crown. And we become jewels and the character that we develop. And the traits that we bring with us as God works with us and develops us are jewels. They're precious. They're gold. They're silver. They're precious stones and precious jewels. And he says, I will make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son and serve, that serves him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. And one way we can we can deal with the difficulties that we face today is through service, being service oriented, being wanting to love one another and wanting to do for one another without any strings attached, without anybody seeing you, just because you know that person needs help or that you want to check up on that person because you love them. Service, get your mind off yourself, get your mind on others and the difficulties that we go through. You know, we go through them that we do. You know, we, we were all born with a stamp, an expiration date stamped on us. You know, as you're younger, you know, can't see it because the ink's small. But the older you get, you, <laughs> you can see it a lot better. And uh, that's just a fact. It's a fact. It doesn't mean to be rude or, or, or crass about it or mean about it. But we can understand that and deal with that through a positive attitude because that's a choice we make to be positive. Or we can be negative. But being positive puts you in a whole different uh, it, it fires up the juices in a different way. It's health to the bones. It helps you uh, personally. It also helps you serve others. That's a choice to be positive about our situation and going to God. And another thing I said last week, and I have it. See, I have it right here. The promises, complete book of promises. Read the promises that God makes us daily. Those aren't just a whim. They're real. And he says in John three times, he says, if you ask me, I'll give you anything, anything that basically is good for you. As long as you're wanting a relationship with God and you ask him for it, ask him for these promises that he said, claim them. But you got to know what they are. You got to dig them out. You got to be looking for them and be positive about those because he's there to be with you and to help you. And just and he's pulling for you. He's not going to lose anybody. No one. But he says, I give you long life. And in Psalm 91, we'll just uh, I'll refer to these. I want, I want to get to the discussion part. 
there's a lot of things to talk about. And I want to hear hear from you and and please be uh, don't be bashful. Go ahead. This is all that you guys own this. This is yours. It's not mine. It's not Marlins. It's not Roy's. It's not Rogers. It's not Norbert's. It's yours. We happen to be part of the family, too. But we want to get to know all of you and you to get to know one another and us. So we we all are family. You know, we all it gives us somewhere to go on Friday night. I uh, used to be in, you know, in, in a former association after services, we'd stand around and try to talk to somebody and they'd be wanting to talk about the baseball game or the basketball game or going to Johnny's birthday party or, you know, you can never get anybody to talk about God. Well, here we have an opportunity. And that's what I was saying earlier. It's so refreshing because everyone on here has that mindset. They have a positive mindset. They, 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 they think about God, like it said, the, the thought upon his name. And it's, it's obvious by what I'm hearing and, and what I'm not hearing is that there's no dissension. There's no bringing on your own uh, ideas, your own doctrines that you have, your pet things that you bring in. We don't have we don't not hear it. It's not there. And I think that's fantastic. It's it's unbelievable. The Psalm 9116 says, with long life, will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? He promises long life. In Psalm 9010, he says, three score and 10, and a little bit more or less for, you know, the way maybe genetics and the way you live your life. But he also says, if you love me, I'm going to show you salvation and I'm going to show you long life. Why is it that we have so many people over 70? I talked to a lady just recently that's 95. 96 and my mother-in-law is 95 and they're both very active very you know <laughs> not debilitated at all they're they're fired up and going and god that's from god god gives you that he says in psalm 48 14 this god is our god forever and ever he will be our guide even to the end so he's going to guide you in those paths if you look to him and ask him to do that. That's a promise. As we get that white hair, as we get that crown of glory, remember that, where it's going, where the path is. Don't get off track. You know, you got that, you got that crown on, you have a responsibility. The queen has a responsibility. She, she's accountable and responsible for certain things, and she knows it. Do we? We have a crown of glory. Do we? know what our responsibility and our accountability is to others and to God. And it's very important, very important that we stay on track, that we hang in there. Hebrews 13, 5, he says, God says, I will never leave you. I'm never going to leave you. Wow. That's the sovereign of the universe, of the cosmos, of everything that's ever been and ever will be. I Look to you. You're special. You're my son, my daughter, and I'm never going to leave you. And I'm not going to let anybody fail if you don't want to. If you forget about the, the crown of glory that you have and you deny it and you take it for granted. Yeah, that, that could happen. Uh, you know, he's not going to force you. And Second Corinthians 4, verse 16, he says, we do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. It's so easy to do today, especially as we get older and aches and pains. And, and, and I'll just be honest, I, I would say if we you know, could do a show of hands technically, you know, we have a lot of people who have lost their mates, men and women. That's tough. That's difficult. I personally don't understand that, but I have heard and I can empathize and sympathize. That's not easy. So as you deal with that, you have to keep a focus. You know, some things it's not possible that anybody can change that. You, it's a process of, of healing. God says, I bring healing in my wings. I bring, you know, I, I help the brokenhearted. I heal the brokenhearted. Through Christ and through God, he can do that. Uh, there are other issues, you know, that we have all the prayer requests we get. Um, <laughs> and it's not only just help. There's other things that happen. So as we go through those things, don't lose heart. 
though our outward outwardly we are wasting away, aren't we? Outwardly wasting away, yet inwardly, that's what really matters. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. That's Second Corinthians four sixteen, and ultimately we get an et- eternal life. We get an incorruptible body. And he talks about putting on the new man through the Holy Spirit, helping, allowing God, working with God, submitting, yielding, and allowing God to create in you holy, righteous character, character be fit for the crown of glory. To wear that crown you saw, like that. How many crowns? There are a lot of crowns. How many things? How many names does Christ have? How many names are you going to have? You know, the most important one is to have that Elohim. Elohim. You know, Steve Elohim. I don't know how it's going to be. I don't know what the names are. You don't know either. But there's something special. Yours is going to be different than mine. But I think in common, we'll all have that Elohim name, which is uh, the family of God. Second Corinthians 5. He talks about a permanent resurrected body awaits us. That's what that crown reminds us of. That's what's waiting. That's what we have to focus on. In spite of all these other things that happen, it's not easy. There is no magic spirit, you know, silver bullet. There isn't one. <laughs> I don't know what, you know, well, I don't know what to say. It's, it, you know, life befalls us all. And, we, we, uh, and I'll tell you what, some of you people are, are extremely tough. You're you're a joy to be around. You're you're that uh, uh, that guide, that uh, support, that direction, that leader, that you know all those things the trials have done through your life. You don't may not may not know it, but you are a uh, beacon to the rest of us. Don't forget it. You know, don't take it for granted. Don't, you know, please be aware that you are. And and, and it's important that we share that with one another. Because if you're an, if you're a light put under a bushel, you don't light anything. If you're out there in the room and there's others in the room, they benefit from that light, don't they? They benefit from the salt and the food. You know, when I end this, God gives us a physical reminder through the, 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 the um, crown of glory. Just like the old man on the bench, he was he didn't have God's Holy Spirit, but wow, he he certainly had character. We have God's Holy Spirit and we should be developing, allowing that to be the workmanship of God. Ephesians 2.10 to be developing to the measure of the fullness of the stature of our God and our king and our big brother and our friend and our Passover and the Lamb of God, and the Son of Man, and the Redeemer, and all of the things that Christ is, that we live our lives, and that crown of glory sh- reminds us, and it shows to others, they see Christ in you. They should be seeing Christ in you. It's a reminder of our purpose, our calling, and our destiny. White hair. <laughs> White hair, crown of glory. When things get tough, remember to focus on the goal. Remember the kingdom of God, his family, and that we're going to be kings and priests. And remember Proverbs 16, 32 that we read earlier. Just flip back there. That it is, I'll just read that real quickly. In closing, be the last scripture. I have several others here, but you can do a study on it. And uh, it's encouraging. It's uplifting. It's inspiring. To go over the promises and, and, and the things that the, the crown of glory focuses toward in our calling. Proverbs 16, 32. The hoary head of the white hair, the crown of glory. It is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Another place it says it's a beautiful thing. Very beautiful. If it's lived in righteousness, in the pursuit of righteousness. So let's remember that and keep our focus on the kingdom of God and that crown that's a reward waiting for us.